we decided that we used the token in order to create some membership whereby those who had the tokens were able to get priority access to the deals if they were a qualified investor. Um, we've integrated with different um, financial securities laws all around the world. Um, and the other thing we wanted to do is uh, we went from knowing every single deal where there would be one deal every four months and we'd be trying to get in that deal every four months or so to getting 50 applications a day. We thought we were in a niche here. Um, last year it went from you know a few deals to 30 applications a day to 50 applications a day. We can't even, our team could even handle that. They don't know what to do with that. Um, so we decided to create a, uh, the, the token in order to reward people to help us with the due diligence process, um, you know, vote on what should be listed on the platform, and try and create some more of a decentralized community in what is a regulated centralized model. Um, and then we, we were decided that we'd, we'd had enough of um, the, you know, the tokens. Many, many people were, in, were purchasing these tokens, and the only reason they were purchasing them is simply because they were traded on a market. They thought they were buying stock in the company, they thought they were buying something, but it turns out they won't. So what we wanted to do is um, launch a, an exchange that essentially um, makes these things the, the actual securities so that people can have the best of both worlds. Shareholder rights at the same time as some of the liquidity of these tokens. So we put it together a model and in 2018, um, we would, uh, we, we, you know, this is some of the coverage that we got, um, and uh, yeah, we did that. And we wanted to show that there is a fully compliant way of doing this um, if you need to and follow securities law. So that kind of brings us to where we are today. Um, it's been an amazing journey. Um, this was us covered in Bloomberg, whereas we're looking to launch our um, secondary market for tokenized securities. Um, that we're looking to launch um, and, and bring that to market later this year. Um, <clears throat> so I now want to go through some of the 29 um, predictions and forecasts, 2019 and beyond. Um, these, this little slide was something that I gave at the Token 2049 conference in Hong Kong. Um, and I believe that we're going to see much like we see in Bitcoin today. In Bitcoin today, we have two completely booming markets. One market is the decentralized hardware wallet to hardware wallet. Um, when I wrote that book in Bank to the Future, the very first draft, I still give the same talk today to help people understand the difference between Bitcoin and banking. And the reason that I got in is because of these three points and still to the same today. Um, the first thing is when you deposit your money at a bank, the bank becomes the legal owner of your money. You think it's your money, they promise to repay you, but if they do two risky things with that money, you soon start to realize it's not yours. If you spend that money in a way that they don't like, you soon start to realize that that money is not yours. If you fly to the wrong country, you soon start to realize that that's not yours. And when you start to send a few million dollars or a few million of any currency around the world, you soon start to realize that you need to explain everything you're doing and you realize that they actually can take that money, seize that money, because it is legally their money. The second you receive those wages in a bank, it is their money. Now, when I spoke at that conference in 2011, what I realized was that Bitcoin was the first digital scarce good that you can own and it existed on the internet um, and was scarce. Um, and so that was, the, if the, essentially it gives you the ability to own your own money. So this is what's very, very attractive to me. The second thing about Bitcoin and banking, because banks own your money that you think is yours, and it's a digital currency that's created by the private banking sector um, that was not created by the government, um, it's created by the private banking sector, um, essentially they spend your money for you. And this is what dictates the business cycles. The way that banks spend your money determines whether your economy is going to boom or bust. Now, central banks and governments try and influence how the, 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 bank, the money is actually spent through regulations and various things. But what always happens is banks always opt for the lowest risk, highest return way of spending your money. And the lowest risk highest return way to spend your money that you think is yours is always lending for property. 
And it's why the property markets continually go up in price with little dips and they double in price every seven years over time, depending on the market you're in, is nothing to do with property, nothing to do with economics, purely because all of your digital currency that you thought was yours is being used as collateral in order to lend for property because it is the lowest risk, highest return way to use the money that you thought was yours. With Bitcoin, it had a peer-to-peer -peer payment system attached to it where you could send it to anyone because you can own it. You can take it from your pocket that you own, not put it on an exchange, which means, remember, if you use an exchange, if you use the Mt. Gox lesson, it means it is just like banking at that point. If you hold it at an exchange, it is not your Bitcoin. It has to be you that owns it, and it gives you the ability to own it. And so because you can own it, you can send it to anyone else that, wants a, that has a wallet that's allowed to own it. And so in summary, with bank deposits, the bank owns that money. With Bitcoin, you own that money. With bank deposits, the bank spend that money, and when you try and spend it, if you spend it in the wrong way, they tell you why you can't. With Bitcoin, you spend it in any way that you want um, to anyone that's willing to accept it. And then the third thing, which I think leads kind of into the debate that I think that uh, Roger and us will have about the future of uh, Bitcoin from here, um, is the, the monetary policy. So with um, banking, um, as I said earlier, as I alluded to, the monetary policy of the country is determined, you could either put it into two schools of thought. One school of thought is that a country has to maximize unemployment or employment, sorry, um, and maximize the goals of the country and inflation and deflation and they create these economic models based upon a science that has never been confirmed where they all debate between the Keynesian, the classic, the Austrian and all these different schools of thought and no one has reached consensus on what this model is and yet we use it to model all of our economies all around the world that affects all of our lives um, and essentially they use these models in order to try and manipulate interest rates and push them by pushing up and down interest rates so that they can try and control the digital currency supply that the banks create. Every time you take a mortgage, every time you borrow that money, every time you do anything that interacts with the, the banking system, if you have, if you log into your online banking right now, if you have a positive balance, it's because somebody else has a negative balance. That positive balance cannot exist unless someone else has a negative balance. This means that it's a constant war around who's going to get the positive balance versus who's going to have the negative balance. And because property prices are taking more and more and more of your income every single month because they're using the money that you thought was yours, um, because they're using the money that you thought was yours in order to push up those prices, it creates a ginormous rich-poor divide where people, more and more assets are going to move to the, from this side um, over to that side. Um, and this was the trend that I was talking about in the book. And so the monetary policy is simply the following. The money supply of any country is simply a function of the bank's risk and um, ability, um, appetite to lend. The money supply is simply a function of the bank's appetite to lend. And in order to lend more, when, when central banks are trying to control the money supply by you know, changing how much digital currency the banks actually create, um, they tend to push up bank interest rates up and down and try and you know, have a say in that process. And then the governments create financial engineering every time it goes wrong, quantitative easing, another invention that was invented here in Japan. Um, or the retail banks use investment banking in order to create a new product. Um, in order to innovate a new way of lending more money so that you can enter a new boom cycle. But eventually, this financial engineering comes to, has to come to a pinnacle. Um, and that financial engineering, I believe now, comes and interacts with digital currencies. And so let me explain that. So at the moment, you have two markets in Bitcoin. You have the people that understand they can own their own money, spend their own money, and then they understand the monetary policy of Bitcoin. Uh, for those of you that don't understand the economics of Bitcoin, it has a fixed supply. There's never going to be more than 21 million of them. And as long as Bitcoin becomes more and more useful, 
those 21 million bitcoins, people are always going to fight in order to accumulate them. In times of fear, they sell them, it pushes the price down. In times of greed, they buy them, it pushes the price up. And the more and more user cases, the more and more useful Bitcoin can become, the more that, the more that um, you, you get this, uh, the, the demand and it only comes out in the price. The economics are as follows. Every four years, at every 10 minutes, newly Bitcoins are created. It's a reward for people that are verifying all the transactions, um, that are performing the role of Visa or MasterCard and verifying all those transactions. And every four years, the number of Bitcoins that are created every 10 minutes half, until eventually you reach the full money supply. That number 21 million um, is a number that will never change unless the, the, the network reaches consensus that it should change, but I don't think that's something that's ever gonna happen. But then again, Bitcoin never surprises me. Um, but, uh, and th this was kind of one of the, th the fears, I'm jumping around a little bit, but one of my fears around the debate that we're, the, the hard fork debates that we're about to have was if you can have more than one Bitcoin, do you now have 42 million Bitcoins? And if you have 42 million Bitcoins, does that mean the monetary supply can change and therefore does that change the economics? That was my number one fear because I'd spent the last few years telling people that that money supply would never change. And that was my entire thesis of how you attract people outside of the, the banking system to one step at a time, um, uh, you know, own their own money, spend their own money and have a sound monetary policy uh, whereby as long as Bitcoin becomes more useful, the value is going to be going up over time if you can take out the volatility um, in between. So Bitcoin has two markets. It has the decentralized market and it has the regulated market. Both are booming. Here's why. Every single fund manager in the world, whether they believe in Bitcoin or not, needs to have Bitcoin in their portfolio because it is an uncorrelated asset. And so the fund managers that are going to be trying to compete for those Bitcoins once they realize this and understand the economics of Bitcoin are going to be sucking Bitcoins out of the supply because they're going to be long term holding as an uncorrelated asset. One of the theses of why this actually went up to 20 million is because this was actually the first um, thing that the banks and the financial institutions suddenly started to realize the economics, that it wasn't a Ponzi scheme, that it wasn't um, the things that they thought it was. And therefore, the retail people were able to get it before Wall Street. And then Wall Street are waiting for the regulations before they come in. And then when they're waiting for the regulations, you've got all these people that are trying to turn Bitcoin into banking where you can't own your own money, where you can't um, spend it as you wish, and that there is no, you know, and so that they're essentially trying to take this thing that you can own and spend and make it into something that has counterparty risk so that you can charge fees on it. But guess what? So many people in the world are waiting for counterparty risk so that someone can lose their Bitcoins for them. <clears throat> but the regulated markets will boom. Um, and so that's why the, all of the exchanges that we invested in, they had record level, levels of people signing up, hedge funds signing up, people signing up, speculators signing up, people using signing up. Um, and so you have this booming regulated market. Um, you will have decentralized tokens and you have decentralized exchanges. You will have regulated ICOs and you have regulated exchanges and both of those will boom um, as people adjust to this asset class. One of the things I'm really excited about is Bitcoin becoming the world reserve cryptocurrency for not just cryptocurrencies, but assets as well. So at the moment, if you want to, in, in, if you want to, um, Bitcoin is essentially um, most exchanges, they don't normally, what they do is there's a few exchanges which bring in traditional fiat money. That money tends to come in and then it tends to stay in crypto. It doesn't tend to go out of crypto. And so the size of the market, the market cap of the entire industry, over time, each year, tends to increase because the friction of trying to get that fiat money in, um, and then it tends not to exit there, it tends to slosh around in different cryptos. And then because there's fiat-backed cryptos as well, um, people tend to leave it in fiat-backed cryptos in times when they want less, less volatility, or in times when they want volatility, they tend to take it out <coughs> to the actual underline, depending on their time frame. Um, <clears throat> but the other thing that I think we're seeing is, so once Bitcoin has now become the world reserve currency of cryptocurrencies, 
So most people flee to Bitcoin in times when they're looking for safety. Um, there is a contender for that. I guess Ethereum came along because it was taking, um, because all of these tokens were built upon Ethereum. Um, but they tend to be um, traded for, for those. Um, but now, every single asset class in the world is now looking at how it can be tokenized. Um, while some people might think that the ICO bull, you know, bubble market is over now, it's only just getting started. Um, these, ev every single asset in the world is now going to be tokenized. Now, the interesting thing about tokenization is that it actually means that everything's traded against the cryptocurrency as well as traditional fiat because the traditional fiat cannot keep up with it fast enough. It's why all of the exchanges, the ones that don't have the fiat, still exist because they use a crypto backed, um, they, they use a, a fiat backed crypto um, in order to, to gain a price. But it looks like there's a potential, and one of the things that I want to make sure happens is that Bitcoin can be the world reserve currency of all assets in the world. Central banks and governments are trying to figure out how do we adjust to this. The ones that have got the most to lose are economies like the US. The US is losing. If you want to raise finance today and everyone wants to do tokens, they are jumping and running away from Silicon Valley in order to raise finance. All of the, these, more and more of these assets, we invested in the Telegram ICO. Now, the crypto community were very skeptical about the Telegram ICO. The reason being is because they were raising $2 billion, um, which seemed like a lot of sell pressure if you're analyzing it from a traditional crypto ICO. But the reality is, is all of that $2 billion was institutional US dollars that needs a regulated way of actually exiting. The friction in exiting is so severe that I think that that's $2 billion that's going to stay in crypto. More and more large assets are now looking at how they can do tokenization. That pulls tons of US dollars, tons of Japanese yen, tons of Korean won into these exchanges. And the friction to get it back is so high that it tends to stay in crypto. So every single asset is now looking at jumping into this liquidity. Why? Because the original people that purchased those bitcoins suddenly became the next wave of wealthy people. They wanted to invest in innovation and disruption and share it around. So they invested in Ethereum. Those that invested in Ethereum suddenly became mega, mega wealthy on top of the Bitcoin that they had. And they wanted to share it and spread it around. And so then suddenly tokens came along and then everyone started creating these tokens. And then the people that invested in Bitcoin and then Ethereum and then the tokens suddenly created this ginormous market capitalization and a ginormous increase of high net worth individuals that were willing to speculate and share this around. So all of these asset classes then started to come. I want some of those Bitcoins. I want some of those ETH. I want some of those tokens. And then I want to create my own token. So it wasn't enough investing in Bitcoin. They wanted to own the process, create their own tokens. And therefore, that was their path through. And all of it, while you can say what you want about that, it's driving more and more and more fiat outside of the banking system into people owning their own assets. Now, initially, they'll probably go by Coinbase, they'll probably go by an exchange, and they'll probably lose their money. But what they tend to do is after having a bad experience or after about a year, they start to learn about this thing called hardware wallets. They start to learn about how to own their own assets, and they don't tend to exit that much. That's why the market cap each year gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I believe that this is going to be the largest redistribution of wealth that we have seen in modern time. And not that it's going to solve all the world's problems. It might just do that. Um, but what we're seeing is every time someone innovates on top of this technology, it pulls more fear outside the traditional financial system and puts it into the token, crypto, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Bitcoin Cash, ecosystem, whatever you want to call it. And today I believe it is one of the most exciting times to be alive in financial history. So I'm just going to go through, uh, I'm not sure if we can get my slide back. Um, okay. The final thing to look at is what's happening at the government level. Well. 
If you're a small island, if you're a US, you've got all these people leaving Silicon Valley because of the SEC regulations. You've got disruption in the IPO markets because all these traditional assets are now looking at doing tokenization and using Bitcoin and you know the friction global money coming around from everywhere because of the speed at which it can move. Um, and then at the same time, um, you've, got, you've got Wall Street disruption, you've got Silicon Valley disruption, and obviously the US dollar is the currency that has the most to lose if central banks start buying Bitcoin. Which central banks are buying Bitcoin? Well, if you're a small central bank that wants to mark your place in the world, I could not think of a better bet than putting some of that electricity that you're generating in your country and mining some of those newly created virgin bitcoins. Um, or you could be, so more and more, I'm forecasting that more and more central banks are going to be getting into the mining industry. They're going to be allocating some of their country's electricity in order to do it on the central bank's balance sheet. Um, they're also, if you are a central bank, and by the way, almost all of them, with the exception of a few countries like Hong Kong and Isle of Man, um, if you're insolvent, like most balance sheets are, with most central banks and most governments, technically almost insolvent, um, then I could not think of a better bet than what Bulgaria did. Bulgaria um, seized some bitcoins. Now you could say that's, uh, you know, say what you want about that, but the story is, the point of the story is what I think is more important. They seized some bitcoins of someone that they believe was a criminal and doing things with that money. They look back at that hard drive about three years later and realize that the value on that hard drive was greater than their entire national debt. <laughs> they're, sold, they, they're in surplus because of that trade. I think more and more small central banks are going to take that bet. They won't tell you that they're taking that bet. The Federal Reserve will never tell you if they're taking that bet. They're probably just holding them in case they get getting ransomed as a, as, a, as a reserve. But the smaller central banks are going to do it. This is David beats Goliath. This is the countries, the, the forward-thinking countries' opportunity to take a speculative bet on whether this could suck out more and more money from the traditional financial system. The small countries are going to take that bet. But it looks like some of the larger economies, some of the most more important economies, are all considering whether they want to take that bet. And the country that I see taking that bet more than any other country in the world is right here, right now, in Japan. <clears throat> and what is going to happen next is I believe there is still systemic risk in the financial system. Guess what? You still can't earn your own money. You still can't spend your money as you wish. And guess what? Nothing has been fixed since the financial crisis. Quantitative easing was a financial innovation to put more debt into the system that already had too much debt. All the other innovations that are coming through, investment banking, credit default swaps, mortgage-backed securities, they were all an innovation in order to pump up the economy to get more debt into that economy. Nothing has been solved. There is still ginormous systemic risk in our financial system and none of it has been fixed. So what are they going to do next? Well, every single central bank in the world has a blockchain innovation department and they are all building their cryptocurrencies as we speak. Every single one of them. Why would they do that? Well, either they want to be cool because they're using the word blockchain and that's the cool word to use in order to get some press release to your country, or they're preparing for a couple of things. The first thing they might be preparing for is to make your cash illegal. Every country in the world does not want cash. Cash is just something that they can't control, that they don't want, that they don't want their people to have. And so as cash becomes illegal in every country all around the world, and just like in China, they try and replace cash with WeChat Pay, I think every central bank is going to try and do the same thing. So when they want to make cash illegal, the way they're going to do it is with their blockchain fiat currency. The other thing that they're going to do is when the next banking systemic risk event happens, which is going to happen, it might be debt in Iceland, some obscure country. It might be student loans in Slovenia that takes down the whole system. It might be credit card default somewhere in the world that takes down the whole systemically risk interoperable financial system. Again, 
But what they're going to do is they're going to allow those banks to go bust. They're not going to say they've implemented laws that allow them to bail it.